Welcome back to another edition of Hand Breakdowns of High Stakes Poker. Commentary by Gabe Kaplan and A.J. Benza, your favorites. Your favorite poker show, High Stakes Poker. It's back. You know, you're wondering, well, well, I can't we have show. It's back. But you just got to get yourself a subscription to Poker Go, okay? Poker Go, it'll cost you freaking whatever. Like, uh, let me see, what other weird vegan food can I come up with that would be like about seven to eight bucks? I don't know. Like a pasta with uh, impossible meatballs and some freaking, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Something that's about eight bucks or something like that. Anyways, get it. If you really want to take yourself seriously or, you know, you want to take poker seriously and you want to get better, you got to get Poker Go. It has all the high rollers. You get to learn from some of the best players in the world. And you have entertaining shows like High Stakes Poker where play, people are playing really high stakes with their own money. Always fun. Cash on the table, just like the old days. All right. So this hand, plenty of cash on the table between uh, myself. Well, Patrick's in there for a second. Uh, and, of course, Tom Dwan, the high-stakes poker crusher. Easily the biggest winner versus the biggest loser uh, <laughs> on the show, historically. So, anyway, let's get straight hey, to the Jack hand. for Dwan. Dwan is definitely entitled to gamble, especially on this show. Hey, two thousand. Patrick raises the 2,000. Cool. This is the first time in this season of high stakes poker that anyone has got kings or aces, and it's Mr. Negrano, who wow. just calls. Just calls with the kings. He is hoping that someone is going to raise. And this is the last player that can do it. Juan's going to three bet to 14,000. He is going to accommodate him. The blinds are two and 400 with a $400 big blind ante. There is no straddle on this hand, but uh, we're still playing pretty deep. You know, what do I got here? I had, I don't know, I had a lot. I had over 100 in front of me. Anyway, so Duan just limps for the 400, okay, under the gun. Now, in this game, and generally speaking, like, he does that sometimes, right? And sometimes he limp raises, right? He's not stupid. He's not only going to limp with his marginal hands or bad hands and, you know, not some of his good hands. So he limps. Right next to him is Patrick Antonius. He picks up a nice little fun hand, the 10-8 suit, and he decides to take initiative, and he makes it 2,000, okay? So me, I'm sitting on, you know, big chips too. I got over 200K. Um... I decide to just flat with kings here. Okay, why would I do that? Why would I do that? Well, two reasons. Hmm. Number one, we touched on, which is to trap potentially Tom Dwan. Somebody behind us, plenty of players might squeeze, but also Tom, who limped under the gun. Maybe he's going to tell a story. Maybe he has ace-king, queens, maybe ace-queen, maybe something like that, where he decides he wants to, you know, limp, see the dead money out there, come after it, pick it up. But the other reason is, when there's a limp and, and Patrick raises early, based on my position, I'm not going to be re-raising a lot here. There's not a lot of hands that I'm going to do that with, right? So a lot of the times in cases where it would be quite obvious that you're just way too strong, like basically what I'm saying is in this spot, I won't have enough bluffs. I'm not going to be three bet bluffing him with like jack nine suited. I, again, I'm not saying that's not a viable strategy. I'm not saying that that's something you shouldn't be doing, but I know that I'm not, Right. So part of like being a good poker player is being self-aware and understanding, you know, people are picking up on your tendencies. So I think most people at the table know that if Duan limped and he raised and I re-raised from that position, it's going to be a pretty nutted range. So I decide let's go ahead and use the fact that Tom limped to potentially pick up some extra stragglers who might raise, back raise. And then of course you got Tom who we're setting the trap for ultimately. So I just flat with the, um, with the Kings, JRB. He goes ahead and from the big blind, he defends ace five offsuit for 2,000. That's probably not a defend uh, considering the ranges, but whatever. We're not going to, you know, fault somebody for gambling. Well, our guy that we were hoping to trap bites, okay? He makes it 14,000. Now, Patrick thinks for a little bit, he folds. And Daniel's got a look that Juan realizes could be trouble. <laughs> he does not like Daniel's look here. 
Daniel's got his paws out like a <laughs> lion that's going to strike. He strikes. 32,000. How old, how old are you now, Patrick? I don't know. You don't know? I was going to leave soon after, but... Um, how old are you? I think if it was anybody else but Daniel, Dwan would go out. But he knows that Daniel is capable of making this kind of move with any hand. Right. No chance you're just 40. Huh? You're only 40 years old. Yeah, everybody in poker thinks I'm a dinosaur. Wow. Because I've been around. I was years. young, but I didn't I think you were 10 years younger than me. Wow. I was older than that when I first came to that. How old are you? 44. Everybody always thinks I'm older in poker. You got to be older. I've been 20 40. years. Dwan calls. <laughs> Comes back to me. And the question is here, do I want to try to get it in? Right? Or do I want to just let him bluff it off? You know, letting him see a cheap flop. Tom doesn't like to fold once he's put money in, right? Pre flop. Like he wants to. If you put, like, small three bets or four bets, he's just going to call, even if he thinks you're pretty nutted, because he feels very strong about his post-flop play, right? So I felt I might be better off getting it in against ace-king, queens, jacks, pre-flop, fine. If he has aces, <laughs> what do you want from me? You know what I mean? That's just a cooler. Send him the money. I wouldn't have been shocked, right? Um, but I decided, in this case, to make a small four bet. Now you might say, well, Daniel, you're sort of contradicting yourself here as I made it 32,000. You're saying, well, you only flat it with the kings because it's too obvious that you have a hand here if you three bet, but now you're four betting after you limp raised? Yeah. <laughs> Hats off, you're right. <laughs> hmm. It's absolutely a contradiction. However, as I said, for that size, I, th I think t Tom finds a way to just probably call even though he thinks I have a nutted range for such a small... And listen, if you pick up the pot there, there's plenty out there. It's not the end of the world, right? So I elected to just try to get it in pre. You know, if he does have a strong hand like queens or jacks or ace-king, I think the money just goes in. So let's just do it now rather than continue to slow play. In retrospect, like considering what I said before about this contradiction, I'm probably supposed to just call, Right? Because now I can have hands like king queen suited, queen jack suited, tens, nines, eights, whatever. When I four bet, kind of eliminating like all those hands for the most part, you know? And I'm just left with the nuts or some, you know, ace wheel card suited bluffs, right? The question is, do I do that a lot? Probably not balanced. So against me, you know, based on, you know, the way I was playing here, you probably fold against my four bets because you should, because they're too nutted, right? So anyway, I decide in this spot to go ahead and make it 32,000. And Don, Don thinks for a long time, and then he finally calls. From Finland. <laughs> and he's going to have to get lucky, catch an ace. And he gets unlucky and catches a jack. <laughs> no, I'm just getting started. Same look. Pause out. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Ready to pounce. Wild Kingdom. The Negrano in his natural habitat <laughs> will stick his paws out. 20,000? He bets 20,000 here, the lion. Now the flop comes. Jack 10-4. There's 68,000 in the pot. It's checked to me. Duan has about 100,000 in front of him. Now, this is something that's changed, evolved in poker, where in the old days, nobody would bet less than half pot in these spots. They'd always bet about two-thirds, right? But actually, when you, know, you use some solvers and you look, you see like, wow, it really likes small bets, especially in a spot like this, right? That's actually a flop that uh, he can hit pretty Good. Like, again, ace-jack, king-queen, ace-queens. A lot of hands are going to continue. We put them in an awkward spot when we bet small. So we're bet 20,000, which is, you know, less than third pot, more than quarter pot. Um, obviously, with the intention of if he jams, we go all in. But, like, also putting him in a weird spot. Like, what does he do with just nines, right? 
I mean, does he call with nines? Does he hope that I have ace, king, ace, queen? Does this allow me to bluff him when I have ace, king, ace, queen? Overall, it just creates a lot of problems. Because this, what we call the stack to pot ratio, isn't all that deep anymore, right? After I bet 20, there's only 80 left. It's not like some super, you know, 300 big blind deep spot where there's like a lot that can be done. So the small bet just is the nuts here. It's really like the only thing that makes sense. Now, with kings, I can check here too, right? I can obviously check. I can bet. And I'm going to do a little bit of both. I think if you're going to be checking, you want to check with aces more often than kings here. Um, but I think it's pretty, pretty close. Anyway, I go ahead and bet the 20000 Now, we know Juan is not going out. But it's very possible for him to raise yes, 20, 20, thinking he has the best hand. These are two great players trying to evaluate each other. It's also possible that Daniel could have ace-king, ace-queen, or even worse, king-queen. Hmm. And he doesn't want to let him draw. And he goes all in. If you don't flop a set on there, cabezas. Cool. Mm -hmm. Two times? All right, we just sure. lost the lion <laughs> image with the running it two times. <laughs> you guys do twice? Sure, two times. Twice. Juan really needs to get lucky with one of these. He'd be so happy to split this pot. Queen on the turn. Well, now he can't win with an ace. He can win with a king. Don't want to make trips. <laughs> Thanks, Doyle. <laughs> Jack or a king? I don't. You're right. Okay. Nope. Always good to win the first one, they say. Now we're back to the ace or jack. Queen again. <laughs> I want to make trips. Now we're back to the jack or a king. Seven. And it's always better to win the second one, too. <laughs> Probably, yeah. But it was a really interesting hand. Watch these guys play each other. But Dwan's loading up again. Got some cranberries there. $100,000. And Dwan thinks for a bit. He sort of sighs as he's doing it. Like, he knows it's no good. But he ships it in with the ace jack. We snap it off with the kings. Like, listen, at that point, with so much money there, we're certainly concerned, right? Because what does his value range look like? Pocket tens, pocket jacks, aces. Queens, kings, don't really think ace jack all that much. Because ace jack, I mean, that's, if it's off suit, he probably should fold pre flop, especially, you know, as I said, my range is too nutted. So, what the fuck? We don't beat that much because king queen is the other hand that makes sense, which is a draw. We got two of the kings, so we block a lot of that. But I'm not folding against Tom in this spot. We get it in, run it twice, and somehow the biggest loser in the game, historically, wins both against the biggest winner in the game, historically. And I was very, very happy about it. But a unique spot. This one is like in the streets outside of sort of uh, too much game theory. Obviously, you know, you know, solvers are going to want you to re-raise Patrick there a lot more. It's not a spot like with a limper and a raise. You just re-raise. But a solver is also re-raising their whole bunch more than I am. Right? It's going to be bluffing adequately. I'm not. So that's why we elect to just slow play the Kings. We look to pick up some stragglers. We picked up JRB, for example, making a loose call with ace five off for five X after, you know, limp raising a call. That's probably a little goosey goosey. So that's the key to poker really is like understanding, you know, theory to a certain degree, but then understanding that, uh, you're not playing against robots. You're playing against people and you can always look for ways in which you can exploit them. Poker, live poker will never get to that point, ladies and gentlemen, where, where, you know, you're playing against someone that's playing GTO. It's impossible. It'll never happen, ever. A lot of guys think they are. Oh, I'm doing GTO. I'm 
You think you're playing GTO, but you're not because you're, it's impossible for the brain. You, th- you can be playing close to it or you can be using the concepts, but the human brain is incapable. So that's what bodes well for the future of live poker going forward. Obviously, those tools are great to study with and to learn from, but in the end, nobody's playing completely balanced in every single spot. I just admitted myself that I wasn't balanced in a couple spots, but at least knowing that, for at least for the first part of it, I knew how to manipulate that so that, you know, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be so easily exploitable, right? And uh, hope that makes sense to you. Hope you guys enjoy these videos where we combine a little bit of like street poker with some game theory, uh, high stakes poker, all the seasons, poker go, that's where you got to go. That's what you got to get. This isn't a request. It's an order. As I've said before, you have to have a poker go subscription. Okay. You have to, it's just a rule. If you want, if you want to be a good poker player and you're really serious about learning and getting better and you don't have a poker go subscription, you're just doing it wrong till next time.